So uh, we started talking about revascularization therapy and uh, for peripheral arterial disease. And I mentioned the two major indications, the absolute indication, critical limb ischemia, and the relative indication, lifestyle limiting claudication. Uh, and that depends on the patient, evidently, how active the patient are, what is his lifestyle. The same way we assess angina. Uh, we don't go by ABI specifically, by the severity of ABI to decide about the indication for revascularization. Uh, I also described the idea of, uh, of uh, one achieve, achieving one unobstructed straight line of flow in critical limb ischemia, revascularizing, uh, revascularizing all inflow all the way to the infrapopliteal vessels and the wound, which is not necessary in claudication. You can only revascularize one segment, iliac and or SFA, and see how the patient does. I want to show this important slide that compares the outcomes of the two modalities of revascularization. And I want to compare those two. One, the endovascular one, and the second, bypass grafting. Uh, those outcomes are the three to five years patency between the two. And what you will notice, two big things here. <clears throat> one, uh, notice that we divide the arterial segments into three, the aortoiliac, the femoral popliteal, which is mainly SFA and popliteal artery, and the three, the infrapopliteal territory. And I will add a fourth one that is infra ankle <clears throat> territory, the pedal and the plantar arteries, which is relevant for the uh, CLI population. So you have, but grossly those are three important segments. And here's the comparison between the two. Uh, what you notice is the more proximal you are, for example, aortoiliac, the better the patency is for both modality. Two, you notice that bypass grafting is better than endovascular uh, treatment in terms of patency at all levels, with some exceptions. At all levels, though, it, is, it has superior patency. So bypass has superior patency at all levels, and the more proximal you are, the better both modalities are. For example, at the aortoiliac level, the difference between stenting and aortobifemoral grafting is not much different. We, we get excellent patency with stenting at the aortoiliac level, okay? Now you go to the femoral popliteal, this is where bypass grafting is superior. There is a catch though. If you use, you have to use femoral popliteal vein graft to get superior patency. So you have to use a vein graft, saphenous vein. In those patients who don't have good veins, such as patient with you know, bad obesity and varicose veins or patient with prior bypass and vein usage, if you use a synthetic PTFE graft, the patency is horrible. Actually, the patency is even worse than the patency with endovascular techniques, okay? So those are exception using synthetic graft causes lower patency than probably endovascular therapy. Uh, that's even worse when you're using synthetic graft to a tibial vessel, femorotibial synthetic graft, okay? Uh, some other ideas here, those numbers have improved with time for endovascular therapy, even at the femoropopliteal. Uh, the, the patency has dramatically improved. Notice that I put here angioplasty plus or minus atherectomy plus or minus stenting. Unlike the coronary field, the standard therapy, endovascular therapy in the PAD, in PAD is not stenting. It is a stenting for aortoiliac segment, but for the femoropopliteal and infrapopliteal, it is not stenting. It's atherectomy and drug-coated angioplasty, plus or, mining, plus or minus a spot stenting for areas of poor result or flow-limiting dissection. So that's the standard therapy. And that standard therapy has improved outcomes and has allowed us to redo some of these patients as they develop restenosis. 
So those numbers have improved with times, still probably do not match bypass, but they have significantly improved and continue to do so. Same at the infrapopliteal level, okay? And at the infrapopliteal level, you don't necessarily aim for five-year patency. What you aim, as I mentioned earlier, you want excellent flow to heal the wound, okay? And the wound may take a few months to heal. So you want those infrapopliteal vessels to be patent for a few months to heal the wound or for a couple of months to heal the wound, depending on the size of the wound. And once the wound heals, even if that tibial vessel reoccludes, once the wound heals, like I said, you need a lot less blood to keep, uh, to keep the skin from uh, getting an ulcer than to heal an ulcer. So you need a lot more blood to heal an ulcer than to prevent it from happening. So even if three occludes, if the wound has already healed, you're okay, you've achieved your goal. Um, now, in terms, those, this is in terms of patency. However, there are, of course, a lot of other things we look at. What's the mortality, perioperative mortality and other complication rate? And even in 1995, uh, a paper in JAMA showed that perioperative mortality is much higher with vascular surgery compared to percutaneous revascularization. And that's why we favor percutaneous revascularization, generally speaking, as a first-line therapy for the majority or overwhelming majority of patients with claudication or CLI. Look at the periprocedural complication, cardiac, renal, stroke, wound complication, bleeding. It's also much higher with vascular surgery than percutaneous revascularization. Keep in mind, this is an old paper. Things have improved with the endovascular techniques and the endovascular complications and our sheath. So um, less complications and more success rate these days with endovascular techniques. This is the only randomized trial of bypass versus angioplasty. It was using critical limb ischemia patient with infrainguinal disease, basically femoropopliteal uh, and tibial disease. So this is the basal trial, very famous trial, also old, published in 2005, but it's the only randomized trial comparing the two techniques. There was no difference in mortality in those patients, and they went all the way to five years. Early on, however, as you can see, there was a, a lot more in-hospital complications with surgery compared to angioplasty, as you can see here, the numbers, and it was statistically significant. Um, there was also a lot more cost with surgery. For those who are healthy enough to survive more than two, three years, it's been shown in that study that probably because of the longer patency, bypass patients do better and have longer amputation-free survival after bypass surgery. So those who survive more than two years are likely to derive more benefit from bypass surgery, but you're not going to be able to know that early on necessarily in a CLI population. So anyway, it shows in a way equivalence and lower early morbidity with endovascular therapy. Uh, so again, those are in summary advantage of endovascular therapy, lower periprocedural mortality and complication, the only option in patients with significant uh, comorbidities and lack of venous conduits, lower but acceptable long-term patency and if you fail endovascular therapy and if you know what you're doing, you do not jeopardize subsequent surgery. So you still always have the option of bringing him back for surgery if you fail. Another thing you need to know in terms of endovascular versus surgery is that task classification, task A, -A <coughs> through, through D, which classifies the anat anatomical complexity. So task A, and this is used for iliac, and SFA. Task A and B, uh, endovascular therapy is, recommend, uh, is recommended for those. Task D, surgery is generally recommended for those by the task guidelines. Task C, either strategy can be used for it. So what is task A, B, C, D? It's confusing, but I'll give you the summary of what it means. So a long, Occlusion of one segment it generally gives you a task C that's you know complex. It gives you a task C, but that's still acceptable for endovascular therapy. Long occlusion involving multiple arterial segments gives you a task D. For example, in, at the iliac level, 
occlusion, 100% occlusion involving the aorta and the iliacs is task B, or long occlusion invol involving both the common iliac and the external iliac is task B. Whereas occlusion involving the common iliac artery or only, or the external iliac artery only is task uh, C. So, you know, task C is fairly complex, but it's definitely amenable to endovascular therapy. And task D, honestly, is also amenable to endovascular therapy. And we've done a lot of those task D, um, in, you know, percutaneously, especially with the new techniques and uh, access strategies that we have today, okay? Uh, this is a task classification for uh, femoral disease, uh, SFA disease. And what you notice, again, task C, for example, it's a long SFA occlusion, more than 15 centimeters. Task uh, D is a long SFA occlusion that also involves the popliteal artery or also involves the common femoral artery. Or it's a popliteal occlusion that also involves the infrapopliteal vessel, the tibioperitoneal trunk, for example. Okay. So know this classification because you know also when we put our report, we like to classify the lesion uh, and say what we are doing accordingly. This is an example of a task uh, actually C uh, SFA lesion. This is a long SFA occlusion from the ostium all the way to uh, distally the adductor hiatus at the junction with the uh, popliteal artery. This is the occlusion, the white, and here we recanalize it percutaneously. And um, for those who do endovascular therapy, most SFA disease is occlusive. Uh, somewhat about, somewhere about two thirds of SFA disease is a CTO. Unlike in the coronary field, so most of our SFA interventions are CTO interventions. And in the PAD field, most of the disease is SFA disease. That's number one. Second is aortoiliac disease. Okay. Uh, I mentioned uh, CLI um, briefly yesterday, CLI revascularization. So there are two types of CLI if you want to classify it. The common denominator to both types is that you have a lot of infrapopliteal disease. The biggest determinant of critical limb ischemia is how much infrapopliteal disease you have, okay? So, and there are two types. Uh, even with this idea, there are two types. One is that you can have infrapopliteal disease along with multi-level involvement. Uh, and the majority of patients have not just infrapopliteal disease, but also multi-level involvement. So they have iliac, SFA, popliteal, along with infrapopliteal disease or you can have isolated infrapopliteal or infra-ankle disease in a third of patients, more so the diabetics, the CKD, the elderly. Now, interestingly, uh, those isolated infrapopliteal disease have higher amputation uh, risk than multi-level disease, simply because they tend to have a more pronounced uh, and more extensive infrapopliteal disease. And again, the worse your infrapopliteal disease, the worse your CLI. That's the, the biggest determinant of your CLI. Having, for example, uh, extensive iliac occlusion, of course, by itself can cause critical limb ischemia, but less so than having extensive uh, tibial, anterior tibial and posterior tibial disease, okay? You're particularly likely to have CLI if both anterior tibial and posterior tibial are involved, although the involvement of only one of them can also cause CLI, but you're far more likely to have it if both of them are involved. And so another idea is that diabetic patients tend to show more obstruction in the infrapopliteal arteries versus smoker without diabetes who have more pronounced involvement of aortoiliac and femoropopliteal arteries. And diabetic patients, yes, they show more involvement of multiple infrapopliteal vessels. Uh, Another important idea, isolated SFA disease. So you see somebody with wound, you do an angiogram, you find long SFA occlusion. Be careful here. Don't, don't just think it's that SFA disease causing critical limb ischemia. Look for something else. Maybe there is popliteal disease. Maybe there is tibial disease feeding the vessel that is feeding the area of the wound that's contributing to the CLI. Because isolated SFA disease does not generally cause CLI. 
because you develop with SFA disease, you develop robust collaterals from the profunda that bypasses the SFA into the popliteal artery. So this patient, for example, you know, seek maybe he also has severe profunda disease. Um, okay, so isolated SFA disease, look for something else on top of it. You need to revascularize the SFA in CLI, but you should have something else along with it to cause the CLI. Um, isolated common femoral or isolated popliteal or isolated iliac disease can cause CLI, but again, not as likely as when it's associated with infrapopliteal disease. I mentioned that idea yesterday that you must restore one line of flow uh, from the iliac artery to the distal limb ulcerated area in CLI. Uh, and infrapopliteal revascularization of at least one vessel is required, especially the vessel that supplies the ulcerated area. And this is what we call the angiosome concept. And I want you to know a little bit that concept. So you have to try to map the wound. Where is the wound? Okay, let's say the wound is at the dorsum uh, of the foot. Then you think this is the anterior tibial dorsalis pedis arteries. And you want to try to revascularize the anterior tibial artery. You have a, a wound at the plantar aspect of the foot. And so it's coming from the posterior tibial artery, you have to revascularize the posterior tibial artery into one of its branches, lateral or medial plantar, depending where your wound is. So that is the ideal scenario. This is what we call angiosome guided revascularization. So it's one line of flow to that angiosome. Now, is this absolutely necessary? Not so, and here is why. The anterior tibial artery, this is the anterior tibial artery, it gives the dorsalis pedis and the lateral tarsal artery. Now the anterior tibial artery communicates with the posterior tibial artery branch. The posterior tibial gives the lateral plantar and the medial plantar arteries. Now those plantar arteries communicate with the dorsalis pedis artery via this point called the deep plantar artery or the plantar arch or the pedal arch. You see that artery, this is communicating the plantar, the two plantar artery, along with it goes up here and it communicates with the dorsalis pedis artery. So you have a communication between the anterior tibial and the posterior tibial artery. If that communication is intact, you do not absolutely need to do an angiosome revascularization. So you have a wound at the a plantar aspect of the foot, okay? And you have an occlusion of the posterior tibial that is extensive and you have disease in the anterior tibial that is easier to revascularize. So go ahead, revascularize the anterior tibial. And as long as you have a good pedal arch, you're going to feed those plantar arteries. So that's a non-direct angiosome revascularization that is likely to succeed. And you do it because it's in this patient, it's easier to revascularize the anterior tibial artery. You do it, you ensure a good pedal arch and you see how he does. So uh, keep that in mind. And there was a paper, a meta-analysis of many studies comparing angiosome versus non-angiosome guided uh, revascularization. And it showed that angiosome guided revascularization improves wound healing, wound healing and major amputation rate. However, this was not necessary and was not the case in patient with intact pedal arch or in patient with a great peroneal artery feeding the angiosome artery. Another thing I didn't mention is that peroneal artery. The peroneal artery is less important in general because it does not reach the toes. However, in a lot of diabetic patients, they have occlusion of both AT and PT extensive occlusion of those, then the peroneal takes a special importance. And in that case, the peroneal may be diseased, but maybe the easiest to revascularize. And if the peroneal gives good collateral, this anterior perforating branch, if it gives good collateral into the dorsalis pedis, and those are cases where the peroneal continues almost in one line into the dorsalis pedis, then in those cases, it's okay to revascularize just the peroneal artery and rely on it to feel to feed the uh, dorsum of the foot and even the plantar aspect via the pedal arch. 
So it's important to know how to map your anatomy in those patients, pedal arch, peroneal communicating branches, um, and you know it's important to map the foot. And I'll show you some CLI cases where I look at the foot in a, a P view and a lateral view to look at all those communications. Anybody who does CLI should be an expert in foot arterial anatomy and in uh, arterial views of the foot, extremely important. This is beside the fact that we stick to those arteries as well um, at times during CLI revascularization. So again, a summary here. So must uh, restore one straight line of flow to the ulcerated area. Uh, so at first step, one may revascularize the vessel that is easiest to percutane street and ensure a good pedal loop. If the ulcer does not heal, then the patient is brought back for revascularization of the appropriate angiosome. He has a plantar wound, I open the AT, it, the wound did not heal, I bring him back a month or two months later and I try to open the posterior arteria, okay? And I mentioned this yesterday, and aggressively achieving one line of normal flow only applies to CLI with wound. It's not as essential for, re for rest pain without wound. Uh, it is not important in claudication. In claudication, you have, let's say somebody has iliac disease and SFA disease and tibial disease. Tibial disease does not cause usually claudication unless it's very proximal. But generally speaking, claudication is one segment below the uh, disease, okay? So if you have SFA disease, you get calf claudication. If you have iliac disease, you get thigh and buttock claudication. Tibial disease, rarely you get foot claudication, but generally you don't get claudication with tibial disease unless it's very proximal at the TP trunk and close to the popliteal uh, by trifurcation. So generally it causes, unfortunately it causes worse than claudication, it causes CLI. But that tells you that in a claudicant, what's most important is to treat the iliac and or the SFA. And you don't need to treat both if he has disease in both. Although I tend to treat both, uh, but you can treat one segment, see how he does, and bring him back to treat the second segment, okay? A more perfect flow is needed to heal ulcers than to prevent them from occurring. The larger the ulcer, the more you need to recanalize more than one infrapopliteal vessel and rely on the angiosome concept. And I mentioned that the wound heals slowly, one centimeter square per month, okay? Uh, here I mentioned that. Now, when do you revascularize in somebody with a wound? And if you're a CLI doctor, you need to know that. Uh, so timing of surgical debridement. Generally, we, you know, if, if, if you have a wound that needs surgical debridement or that needs amputation, or that needs, uh, let's say you have osteomyelitis and you need to do localized amputation. One, keep in mind, you have to keep your surgical debridement and your amputation very limited. That's the key concept, modern concept in CLI, okay? We don't want those BKA, below knee amputations. We try to do limited toe amputation if needed or distal foot amputation if needed, maximum, uh, as much as possible. Uh, so we try to preserve the foot. And when do you do those procedures if needed? You will generally do them after revascularization. So you allow the surgical site and stump to heal and the surgical wound to heal. We only do that surgery is done before revascularization when there is infection, okay? And in that case, you do some degree of uh, surgical debridement, you do your revascularization, and sometimes you bring the patient ba back for uh, further surgical debridement and revision after revascularization. So you may do some debridement and surgery before and after revascularization in the case of infection. Otherwise, generally, it's before um, you do revascularization before surgical debridement. Okay, uh, this is again different in acute limb ischemia that I described earlier, where if you have extensive ischemia and gangrene with, from acute limb ischemia, you're at an irreversible necrosis stage. Those are patients where in acute limb ischemia, the thrombotic quick process where you have a high risk of reperfusion injury, those patients you amputate, then you potentially revascularize. But that's different because they have a high probability of reperfusion. Injury. That's not the case here in this smoldering chronic process. 
uh, a superficial dry gangrene uh, of the toe, like some of the pictures I showed earlier, they require debridement and local care, but often heal well after revascularization. Amputation is not usually required, and if needed, keep it distal. Here, I'll show quickly. Uh, for example, those, you don't need to do generally, or let me show this. Those, you know, you don't need to do amputation for this. Even for that, those area can heal just with revascularization. You don't need to do amputations for those. Even that, depending if the bone is involved here, you very likely need to do limited toe amputation. But again, you keep it as limited as possible. This person doesn't need any amputation and we did not do any amputation on him. Same here. All right, there are some other ideas I want to mention. Osteomyelitis, I mentioned how to uh, diagnose this, visible or palpable bone or uh, you know, a deep ulcer that can be probed to the bone with a blunt uh, tip uh, needle. Uh, sometimes an ulcer that is large, more than two centimeters square, is also suggestive of osteomyelitis. I like to just do that physical exam and x-ray to make a diagnosis of osteomyelitis and the extent of it. You can do MRI if the you know, diagnosis is not established clinically and you have high suspicion uh, because the ulcer is large. General teaching is osteomyelitis requires uh, some form of amputation, localized amputation beside antibiotic, long antibiotic therapy. But several modern series suggest that a non-surgical approach may also be adopted. You, you do your long antibiotic therapy, you revascularize, and if the wound heals, you may not need to do amputation, even if there was an underlying uh, localized osteomyelitis. Okay, you keep following those patients and see what happens without any amputation. Another idea is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, you know, <clears throat> it's mentioned in the guidelines for CLI. Know that it's uh, questionable, of questionable value. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, if you want you to know one idea, it's mainly used after you've revascularized. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy in a hyperbaric chamber will improve wound healing only after you've revascularized. If you do it in somebody with CLI and a bunch of infrapopliteal occlusion, it's not going to do anything. You're not going to be able to deliver that extra oxygen that you're providing to the patient. You have to revascularize, and this is when hyperbaric oxygen therapy may be a good adjunct to allow a quicker healing of the wound, okay? And this is based on a Cochrane review, hyperbaric O2 improves short-term, but not long-term wound healing with no clear reduction in amputation. Hence, it's an adjunct to revascularization and it's given class 2B in the guidelines, but you will come across that therapy. Uh, another thing regarding treatment I wanna mention for claudication, the guidelines give class one for all those three things here, exercise program, which can improve your walking distance. If you do it regularly, 30 minutes a day, it can improve your walking distance by, uh, by four times. So really dramatic improvements, smoking cessation, which is really the main intervention that reduces your risk of amputation. At the claudication level, revascularization does not reduce amputation. Smoking cessation reduces your amputation risk by 10 times, 10 times. So it's an amazing intervention. And it improves your walking distance as well. Uh, plus all, of course, the cardiovascular benefits. And silostazole. Silostazole improves the walking distance and improves claudication. It is given a class one indication in claudicum, uh, you know, before considering revascularization. So think of silostazole if they have no contraindication such as heart failure. Heart failure is the main contraindication to silostazole because it's a positive uh, inotrope, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Uh, okay. So um, I'm going to describe, give you some questions here, okay? So to practice, a 55 year old man smoker presents with severe calf and foot pain that has been progressive for the last uh, three weeks. The pain is present at rest, persists throughout most of the day, and is worse at night. 
Uh, on exam, his great toe is mottled, purple, and distal pulses cannot be heard on Doppler. Motor exam is intact, but sensing is impaired uh, at the tip of the great toe. Which of the following is correct? Uh, you can read the options and try to think what's the answer and try to write me the answer. This is a critical limb ischemia, bring it back in a few days. There is, um, this is acute limb ischemia, revascularize immediately or acute limb ischemia, but no need for immediate revascularization. What is the answer here? So I'll give you the answer. It is C. This is not critical limb ischemia. This patient has acute rather than critical limb ischemia as evidenced by the absent pulses on Doppler, which I told you is the hallmark differentiating factor by, between acute and critical limb ischemia. So he's going to have a quick deterioration and quick limb loss, a uh, quick progression between pain to sensory loss, motor loss, then extensive gangrene and full paralysis. So, uh, and this is evidenced by the absent pulses on Doppler, the constant rather than intermittent rest pain and the degree of cyanosis, the mottling, um, you know, purple. I told you the more you have skin changes, the more likely there is some acute process at least superimposed. Also in this context, the distal sensory loss implies in a threatened limb and, in, in a, and it requires emergent revascularization. It's the stage two of ALI that implies emergent revascularization. You know, somebody could be confused if he's obsessed by that guideline definition of acute limb ischemia is less than two weeks. This patient has been having pain for three weeks, but you know, the other findings are more important uh, for the definition of acute limb ischemia. It's somewhat subacute, which suggests more of a in situ thrombotic, progressive thrombotic process rather than an embolic process. If you have cardioembolism causing acute limb ischemia, presentation will be more acute than that. In situ thrombosis can be slightly slower and slightly more subacute than an embolic phenomenon. So this is not an embolic phenomenon. The answer is C. All right, this is a second question. A 70 year old with no known history of CAD has right calf pain when he walks one block. This is not lifestyle limiting for him. He does not have any tissue loss. ABI is 0.5 on the right, which statement is correct? In geography and revascularization should be considered in light of the severity of the PAD. His likelihood of CLI is more than 20% at five years. Uh, his claudication is likely to pro progress over the next few years. Peripheral revascularization would reduce his risk of limb loss. His risk of cardiovascular event and mortality is more than 5% per year. Yes. Excellent answer, it's E. So as I described, we don't go by the severity. A severity of ABI can predict progression to CLI and especially predicts the severity of your cardiovascular outcomes, but it does not dictate revascularization. The likelihood of CLI in the next five years, as I mentioned it generally for Claudicin, it's about 4% at five years. He may be higher because of the severity of ABI, it may be anywhere between four to 20%, but still it's not uh, more than that. Uh, his claudication is likely to progress. As I mentioned in the, uh, my first slide in the prior talk, very important slide, most claudicant, 70, 80% of them remain stable at five years and you need to know that. And so the most important thing is that his risk of cardiovascular event and mortality is very high. He has, worse outcomes from a cardiovascular standpoint than from a limb standpoint, which tends to be stable over time. All right. Uh, next question, a 58 year old man, uh, active smoker, complains of bilateral calf pain after walking one block. This is impeding his daily walks. Uh, ABI is 0.6 on the right, 0.7 on the left. He tried the daily walking routine without success. In geography shows a totally occluded right SFA that is long, 15 to 20 centimeter in length, calcified with reconstitution at the popliteal level. What is the next step? So uh, add silostazole, recommend daily walking program for three months. 
Percutaneous revascularization is not acceptable as this is a task D lesion. Percutaneous revascularization is acceptable as this is a task C lesion. One year patency less than 60% or more than 60%. Yes, excellent answer. The answer is C. So this is task C lesion. It's a long occlusion of one segment, the SFA. Task C, it's you know perfectly amenable to PC to, to endovascular therapy these days, especially with experienced operator. The Achilles heel remains long-term patency. Long-term patency of this long SFA occlusion remains less than 60, 50%. Uh, we hope more with our atherectomy and DCB, drug-coated balloon strategy, and focal stenting, but, you know, patency may be, unfortunately, still, you have to answer it that it is still somewhat low. But uh, this is the answer C. You could argue maybe do silostazole and try more daily walking. That's acceptable as well. There is no urgency in claudication, but that's the preferred answer. He has lifestyle-limiting claudication. Okay, so next answer, the uh, next question, sorry. A patient presents with uh, left great uh, toe ulcer and at the dorsum uh, and dorsum of the foot ulcer. He has non-compressible left tibial vessel with ABI more than 1.5. His left distal uh, pulses are non-palpable, which statement is incorrect. The elevated ABI does not rule out significant PAD, but rules out critical PAD. In this case, we're implying, well, his ulcer is not ischemic, it's neuropathic, for example. Uh, the elevated ABI has at least the same negative cardiovascular implication as low ABI, especially in symptomatic patients. Um, the toe brachial index or, um, or arterial Doppler may be used to confirm the severity of PAD. Abdominal aortic angiography with bilateral femoral popliteal runoff is warranted. So which one is incorrect? Yes, correct. The answer is A. So everything I described, B, C, D are correct. Uh, elevated ABI has the same negative cardiovascular implication as a low ABI. A TBI or arterial Doppler actually and arterial Doppler are needed to confirm the severity of PAD before eventually doing angiography and revascularization. All right, next question here. The patient in the prior question with that wound of the toe and the dorsum of the foot is found to have severely diseased left external iliac, heavily calcified, totally occluded left SFA, and severely diseased but patent anterior tibial with a patent non-obstructed uh, PT. AT feeds the ulcerated area. What is the next step? Perform stenting of the left iliac if the ulcer does not heal, bring back for the SFA. Perform percutaneous therapy of both the SFA and the iliac. Perform percutaneous therapy of the iliac SFA and AT, or perform iliac stenting and femoral popliteal bypass. So the last uh, option is what we call hybrid therapy, and we do that sometimes in complicated disease where you know we don't want to do aorto bifem uh, grafting and femoral popliteal grafting. So it's easy to treat the iliac with stent. We treat it. It's, he has extensive SFA and popliteal and infrapopliteal disease. Difficult for percutaneous therapy. We do fem popliteal or fem tibial bypass. This is what we call hybrid therapy. I generally try to treat it all percutaneously and you know that's preferred if feasible in those sick comorbid patients in general. But know of the availability of that approach, the hybrid approach. Anyway, for this, I think the best answer is C. Good, um, good answer. Um, so here's the thing. You need to achieve, like we described, one straight unobstructed line of flow. So yes, the iliac SFA need to revascularize. You can argue that since he has a good PT and if he has good pedal arch from the PT to the dorsum of the foot, you do not need to open the AT. But since the AT is not occluded, not 100% occluded, I, the question suggests that it's easy to open it, then yes, I think you should go ahead and open it and provide him uh, the best chance of healing his extensive wounds. He has multiple wounds. So 
If it, the AT was more extensively diseased, you can just rely on that PT and the pedal arch, ensure a good pedal arch by doing again, anterior, uh, anteroposterior view of the foot and lateral view of the foot to ensure good communications. Uh, but uh, if, the easy, if it is easy to revascularize the AT, go ahead and fix it. Or if it's not very difficult, go ahead and fix it. And so the answer is uh, C. Uh, question six, a patient has severe left lower extremity claudication. He has severe disease of the left external iliac, totally occluded SFA and infrapopliteal disease across the AT. What is the next step? So kind of similar to the prior one, but I'm telling you here, what do you revascularize? This one is a claudication. The other one was critical limb ischemia. So stand the left iliac and stop, see how it does, or stand both the iliac and the SFA, uh, or do treat all of them, iliac, SFA, and AT, or do uh, stent and bypass. What's the best answer here? So the best answer is A. In case of uh, claudication, uh, you do not, you know, you can revascularize re each segment and see how he does. You do not need to revascularize the AT in general anyway, the infrapopliteal segment without wounds. So you can treat the left iliac. If claudication persists, bring back for the SFA. I'll tell you my practice has been to treat both, this one, to, to do B, treat both the iliac and SFA. It's been my experience that when you have long total occlusion of the SFA, that tends to be the biggest determinant of your claudication. So I tend to treat both in one session, but anyway, it's totally appropriate and probably the guideline answer will be this A. All right, uh, question seven, which statement is incorrect? Surgical bypass has higher patency than percutaneous therapy for all lower extremity segment, except when a synthetic graft is used for below knee uh, femoral popliteal grafting or femoral tibial grafting. For initial revascularization, percutaneous therapy is generally preferred to surgical bypass because of the lower perioperative morbidity, mortality, and convalescence period. Uh, for infrapopliteal disease, femoral tibial grafting is preferred to percutaneous therapy as it allows better ulcer healing. For common femoral disease, femoral endarthrectomy is preferred therapy and is a relatively low risk vascular surgery. So what's the best answer here? The incorrect answer, basically. I will give you, so it is correct in D, D is correct for common femoral disease. It's one of the easiest vascular surgery. And it's still one of the area where your first line therapy may remains a preferably femoral endarterectomy surgery. It's not bypass, it's endarterectomy. And it's a localized vascular surgery that is a regional vascular surgery that is fairly low risk and uh, achieves a very good long-term patency at five years, plus over 90%. That's still the preferred treatment for common femoral disease where it's difficult to stand. Another alternative is to do percutaneously, and that's what I do, atherectomy, using directional atherectomy and drug-coated balloon. And I've got a great result with that. And there are series suggesting very good result with endovascular therapy of common femoral disease. But the preferred answer is still usually femoral endarterectomy for common femoral disease. But the incorrect answer is C. For infrapopliteal disease, femoral tibial grafting is not preferred to percutaneous therapy. Uh, both achieve good wound healing. And with percutaneous therapy, you can actually do more. You can revascularize more segments. You can go more distally. You can revascularize infra ankle and pedal arch vessels. Okay. Uh, so next question here, uh, a patient has lifestyle limiting claudication while walking one block, mostly involving the thighs. Distal pulses are palpable and femoral pulses are normal. Which statement is correct? The patient likely has pseudoclaudication from hip osteoarthritis or spinal stenosis. Arterial claudication is possible. The patient may have moderate iliac or distal aortic disease with normal flow and pulses at rest but insufficient uh, flow and reduced pulses of exercise. Perform ABI, perform ABI at rest and with exercise. For the interest of time, I will give the answer here. Uh, <clears throat> the answer is E. It's basically B plus D. So 
Even though the ABI is normal and pulses are normal at rest, in a claudicant patient, if the description is really typical of claudication, it's only with exertion, it's only with, with walking a certain distance or a certain hill, uh, in a patient with either diabetes or smoking. Those are the two big risk factors for PAD. It's highly unlikely that you have PAD if you do not have diabetes or smoking. So in this context, claudication is possible even with normal pulses and normal resting ABI. In this case, it's best to do ABI with exercise to make the diagnosis. Arterial ultrasound can also make the diagnosis in such patients, okay? Like I mentioned, with exercise in clinic, you can make them run and see that those pulses attenuate with exercise, the same way ABI attenuate with exercise. So next question, a patient presents with severe right foot pain, persistent for the last two days. His foot is mottled blue. What is the most important immediate step? Emergent angiography and revascularization, Doppler the distal pulses and perform sensory and motor exam of the right lower extremity, CTA. It's a bit of an unfair question. Uh, both A and B are good. I mean, you can go with A, but the idea here is that I want to get, you know, I want you to do a perfect assessment of a patient with acute limb ischemia. The presentation is, you know, definitely acute limb ischemia, severe persistent foot pain, with pronounced skin discoloration. The idea here, you want to do the Doppler distal pulses that will confirm your acute limb ischemia because typically you will not hear any arterial pulse uh, on Doppler. And I want you to do sensory and motor exam because if you have profound, to classify the patient in stages two to four, if you have profound, uh, uh, for example, let's say this, if you have extensive sensory loss or if you're starting to have motor loss, you're stage three and your limb is immediately and, uh, threatened and you need to perform surgical revascularization, not TPA percutaneous revascularization. And you need to do fasciotomy because of the high risk of reperfusion compartment syndrome. So it's important to do this assessment to decide what strategy to do. Conversely, if you have no sensory loss or only distal sensory loss, then percutaneous therapy with infusion of TPA to resolve the clot is an appropriate therapy, okay? Conversely, if you have paralysis, if the severe motor loss and paralysis, well, this is stage four, and unfortunately, the patient should undergo amputation before revascularization. So it's important to know the stages of acute limb ischemia. I will show you the slide again so that you can review it. Um, here, those are the stages of acute limb ischemia that I described. And those are the uh, reperfusion stages. Also keep in mind, uh, you may hear venous doppler in those patients, uh, except for the very last stage. So you don't hear arterial doppler, but you hear, so you hear something like a C wave, a very mild C wave. That's a venous doctor. Do not confuse that with arterial doctor. With experience, you'll be able to distinguish. I'll show you the last question here. A 72-year-old man, heavy smoker, presents with pain, mottling, and cyanosis of his right great toe, which has been progressive over the last week. So a lot of uh, skin changes of his right great toe. He also has purple patches on his calf. The femoral pulse is mildly reduced. The PT and DP are not palpable, but have a very good Doppler signal. The right ABI is 0.75 um, sorry, on, uh, at 0.75. On Doppler, the flow is monophasic throughout the right lower extremity. CTA shows heavily atherosclerotic aorta and iliac artery with 80% right iliac uh, stenosis. The other arteries and infrapopliteal arteries are patent. What is the next step? Heparin and urgent stenting of the right iliac artery or conservative management. Correct, the answer here is B. I want you to know what is the process here. That, can anybody tell me what the process is? Is this acute limb ischemia? Is this critical limb ischemia? Or is this another process? So this is another process called atheroembolization from the aortic segment. 
So it's not acute limb ischemia, clearly has no total occlusion of any segment and it has good Doppler signals. So he has a pronounced skin changes yet no acute limb ischemia uh, and no profound drop in flow to his lower limb. His ABI, which correlates here with the angiographic findings is relatively in the mild range. Uh, so, and 80% iliac stenosis should not cause uh, by itself that much of limb ischemia. So a rest limb ischemia. So this is what you call atheroembolization. So, and again, evidenced by the discrepancy between the severity of the foot ischemia and the rather mild impairment of pulses and uh, mild ABI reduction. In fact, the patient has foot ischemia with much less ankle ischemia, uh, implying very distal atheroemboli. So the last thing you want to do, I mean, you could do it actually, but it's probably not preferred in this case to go and do maneuver and manipulation over that aortic iliac atherosclerosis and cause potentially more atheroembolization. So while some people may stand the right iliac, uh, there is a concern that this will lead to more atheroembolization and may aggravate the foot ischemia. Therefore, I prefer conservative management and foot care is warranted in those cases. Foot ischemia actually will improve in the majority of atheroembolism cases. Those purple patches on his calf are what you call levedo reticularis, and that's another evidence of atheroembolization.